Good evening and welcome to this webinar session on project and bid evaluation for waste treatment and disposal technologies. This is a part of the ongoing series of webinars under the Climate and Clean Air Initiative, CCAC. The CCAC was launched by the UNEP and aims to catalyze rapid reductions in short-lived climate pollutants to protect human health, agriculture, and environment. Today's topic, bid design and evaluation, is of prime importance and assumes a great significance behind successful implementation of solid waste management projects. To take us through with more on this, we have with us Ms. Dana Murray from SES Engineers. Ms. Murray has 24 years of professional experience in civil environment engineering, including landfill gas emission modeling and collection dis system design, transfer station design and construction experience. She has provided technical assistance to US EPA's landfill methane outreach program for over 16 years, including authoring several training presentations and manuals for CCAC and Global Methane Initiative. We also have with us today, Professor P.U. Asnani, who is the chairman of Urban Management Consultants. He is one of country's renowned experts on urban governance and an expert on solid waste management. He has worked in the urban and rural sectors for over 35 years, and is currently on the Central Monitoring Committee of Ministry of Environment and Forest to oversee the implementation of Solid Waste Management Rules 2016. He is also the Chairman of the Expert Committee for Evaluation of Waste to Energy Proposals, constituted by the Ministry of Science and Technology. He is the Principal Author of Solid Waste Management Rules 2016, and has co-authored the National Manual on Solid Waste Management. He was a member of the Supreme Court appointed Expert Committee on Solid Waste Management for Class 1 cities of India. Mr. Asnani was awarded the title of Nagar Bhushan for, award, uh, for outstanding services in the urban sector on the, global uh, on the Golden Jubilee celebrations of India's independence. So we will start with a 25 minutes uh, presentation from Ms. Dana Murray, followed by a presentation by Professor Asnani, and then open for a question and answer session. You can send us your uh, questions during the session or uh, during the session or post the uh, uh, presentation using the small chat box on the right-hand side of the page. Uh, with that, I'm going to enable the audio for our experts for the day and turn things over to Ms. Dana Murray. All right. Good evening, everyone. And thank you. I wanted to thank Terry and APT and CTAC for having me um, tonight. Um, I'm going to focus mostly on setting up the RFP or the bid process so that that can be um, I consider that the foundation for the successful bid evaluation. I think that's very important to have all that um, done correctly. So for, to, for tonight, I'm going to look at um, the goals of the process, planning for the, um, the process, and um, the essential elements that should be including included in either the RFP or the bid process and evaluation of the proposals or the bids. So I interchangeably use the term request for proposal and bid because I think that these fundamental um, points that I'm going to make could be used when you're setting up a request for proposal for professional services as well as for the bid process. So I, I thought it was thought it would, could be used interchangeably, so I kept it that way. Um, I hope, hopefully that's not too confusing. So the overall goal, obviously, we want a successful process, and we want um, that starts with the RFP and bid that works for all parties. So in setting these up, I always think it's important to protect the municipality's interest, but also to make it a fair process for the contractor or the professional services that's going to be bidding on that. Because you want to encourage them to participate and you want uh, quality, qualified companies. So we want to make sure that it is a fair process and it works for all parties. We obviously want the municipality to have a quality project and we want it delivered on time and within budget. Those are the ultimate goals. So there's some things to consider before issuing either an RFP or a bid. And I just thought I'd make a list for you that would be helpful. First, as a team, you would need to sit down and decide who's going to administer this bidding process. 
And maybe that's already a set position in your organization, but this person would schedule the site visits before the, um, during the process. They would be the point person to answer questions. They would be the person that would be holding the pre-bid meetings. And then they would also, maybe this would be a team effort, develop the ranking system to evaluate the responses against the pre-established criteria. So your team would probably include people such as a financial and procurement expert. Obviously, you would want to have legal counsel, an attorney, general counsel. You would also want to have your technical experts involved. And at this point during the if this were a construction, you would maybe want your municipal engineer involved. And then I underlined the term project champion. This would be somebody who, this is their pet project, that's a term we use, that they, they're really behind this. It's a very important project to them. And that is really a key to the successful project. Other things to consider is to ensure that your, your documents are ready. So if this is a project that's going out for construction, you want to make sure before you put the bid out that your design is complete and that the design has been reviewed by the municipal engineers and that it meets all the specifications for your municipality, your local regulations, the state regulations, um, national regulations. And that you also want to make sure the specification documents are approved. So those are ready to go. And then obviously, if there's any permitting involved, that the municipal permits for that have been re received. So the next thing would be, what what do you want from this project? What are the real, real what what is the realistic project schedule? So things to consider when thinking about that schedule. We all want things done really quickly, but what what is realistic? We have government. We know that along the way, there's going to be approvals that are going to be needed. We know there's budget cycles. Um, so maybe the project needs to start at the beginning of your budget cycle. You um, also know that there's there's other activities going on. So if you are doing a project at your um, sanitary landfill, then you want to make sure you have the other activities out of the way that you can you can have a construction project have its own area. Um, if it's at a transfer station, you want to make sure you have an alternative transfer station in place so that the construction project can be done and accomplished clear of other activities. We also want to consider time for permitting, and you would probably know best for your particular municipality how long that process takes. And obviously, weather. If you have, you're issuing your project start to be at the beginning of the monsoon season, you all know that that would probably be problematic. So these are things to consider when you're setting up your schedule. So this is for the team. Before you issue the before you issue the RFP or the bid process, you want to make sure that you've done some due diligence in that your project has been evaluated for technical feasibility, and that it's been evaluated for economic feasibility. I just put those in there as a reminder, but I'm sure that that's something that would be done early on. Consider, and then also when you're before issuing the RFP, there's some options for you. So consider the type of contract that you're seeking. And, and in some cases, these um, particular projects may be more technically advanced. So you may be looking for a specialty firm. And you might want somebody that can actually do from the beginning to the end. You might want somebody that can do the design and the build. And that way, there's uh, cohesion between those two processes. And they can usually work things out a little better between um, the design, like if there's something missing in the design and the contract to build it, they would be able to work that out internally. Obviously, if you have a design engineer and you're just looking for construction only firm, that would be another kind of contract. There's also installed waste projects 
there is an example where you could have somebody build the project and then they're also the operator. So for a sanitary landfill, for example, you could have the contractor also be the operator. So once they build the sanitary landfill, then they would operate the, do those operations. So that's a different kind of contract. And then there's a full bundle. You can have a, a firm that would do, these would be more for smaller projects, I think, like an anaerobic digester or a landfill gas project where you would have design, build, operate. So that's another um, option for you. But these are things to consider when you're, um, when you're setting up your bid process. Other things to consider prior to that are what, what are your protocols at your municipality for setting this up? And you, you would know best, but things that might be, that you might have are, what are your legal requirements? Do you need to put out an expression of interest first? That might help you to narrow down qualified bidders. And that goes along with the next bullet of pre-qualifying your bidders. So that's one thing you could do, especially for the more difficult projects, like an anaerobic digest or a landfill gas project. You wouldn't want somebody who's never done those types of projects before. Do you have requirements that you need to advertise your projects on uh, websites or local newspapers? And what is the time frame for that? Do you need to do it for 30 days? Um, so those are all things that you need to remember when you're setting this up. Also, are you going to have some pre-bid meetings? Maybe just one meeting, maybe two. And then um, all of this is so that you're, you can you know, set it up to receive and compare multiple proposals. And Obviously, we talked about it before, but you're setting them up to as a transparent uh, criteria. So you want to have that. We'll talk about that in, a, in, in later on. And another thing that I would like you to consider or something to think about is the safety record of the contractor. So if he has some documentation where he has performed other projects, where you know has had a safe record, that would be something good to know. And you obviously know that if you ignore any of these requirements that you have at your municipality, that it might invalidate your bid process. So just want to keep those things in mind, and you would know best what those are. All right. So now you've got that set up, and you've been th you're thinking about it. What are some of the background elements that you would want to include in your RFP or bid? Obviously, you want the scope of work. And this can be either for the engineering um, RFP or for the construction project. You want to include background information that you have about the site. Do you have drawings? If it's construction project, obviously you have drawings, but if it's at an engineering level, then maybe you have some drawings from previous projects. Do you have maps, um, roadway information? The waste data might be helpful. Um, timelines, and then we also want to know the timelines for the proposal and the project. So what are your expectations of how this project is going to be um, finished in a timely manner? And also, when you're considering this, what are your timelines for the bidding process? So do you advertise, have the documents ready, and when do you want them turned in? So for construction project, I would say 30 days is, is, is a necessary time for um, them to respond for the larger projects. And as we discussed earlier, you may want to do um, have qualifications for your vendor to make sure that you get a qualified vendor. And again, the safety requirements. So now you need to make sure you have your bid documents and those are included in the bidding process. Also that might be helpful to the contractor is other relevant reports such as a ge geotechnical evaluation of the site. If that's already been done, that might be 
helpful to include. The proposal evaluation criteria or the bid evaluation criteria needs to be clearly listed so that you can evaluate the proposals and the bids at an equal level. And then anything else that your, this would be where the lawyers come in. Do they have specific forms, registrations? Um, do you want to set page limits? Is there a fee to get the documents? Is there a fee to propose? Um, and then any contact information for questions. So um, these are things that you can you can request for your respondents to provide to you. Obviously, you want a description of the company, their experience and project history on similar projects. So you would like to have, I call them past project um, profiles or project histories, a couple examples, maybe some references of other um, municipalities that they've worked for, and then scope of services that they typically offer as a company. That would be a good piece of information for them to submit to you. And their, their technical and financial qualifications. You want to make sure that they are financially qualified to, to be able to co complete the work. Um, and that goes along with uh, maybe asking for a project financing plan or a letter of credit. You don't want them to run out of money halfway through the project and not be able to complete it. So we've all had that happen. Other things that you would want to include is the regulatory requirements. So have them show you how they can be responsible to comply with environmental compliance. And that might be during construction. Do you have stormwater requirements during construction? Are there um, way requirements uh, for how you store materials during construction, all of that should be laid out. And then the project, does, does the project itself comply with environmental regulations? So when they're building the project, since this is an environmental project, you want to make sure that they build it, that it will comply with those regulations. So for example, for a sanitary landfill, when they're constructing the the liner at the bottom of the landfill, that needs to comply with the environmental regulations. Um, and also have them demonstrate to you that they have a plan for how they're going to get the permits for the different stages of the project. And, and then if there's any type of community approval. And then, then other things to include would be the detailed schedule. So have them show, show you how they're going to meet their milestones and complete the project on time. And then if this is the build, operate, or design build, operate project, you would like to see the operations and maintenance plan, obviously. So now we need to evaluate the RFPs and bids, and we want to um, compare each response to meet, so that they can meet the performance of the of this specific project. So by setting this up in the beginning with clear expectations and all the required documents, hopefully your responses will be easy to, easy to compare. I would recommend that you avoid basing your selection only on low bid, particularly for the more advanced projects like a building a anaerobic digester, a landfill gas system, or the landfill liner. I think those require you to have the qualifications and not just the lowest bid. So you would want to, if while reviewing these proposals, if there's an opportunity for you to either interview the uh, shortlisted folks, then you could ask questions of them or ask them clarifying questions in writing and give them a deadline to return those questions. So I would say that you want to select your team that's demonstrated experience with similar, similar projects and that you've seen that they have the ability to manage projects and meet schedules. So all of that can be done in, um, as we discussed by asking them for those types of things during the process. So 
particularly for selecting professional services, you first want to evaluate them on a technical basis. And then secondly, look at the financial considerations. But that might also be something to do for construction projects, projects, especially for the more technically advanced projects. So I think you should consider that, and that kind of leads to not always selecting the low bid. So in conclusion, the well-written RFP or bid will provide anticipated con um, well anticipated contract terms for you and clear understanding of the role of the project scope and it'll minimize, minimize uncertainty. So as I said in the very beginning, I think that this is the, the, the basis for, for a, a successful project is a well-written RFP and bid. And here is my okay, contact um, information and I'd be happy to um, respond to any questions in your email in, in an email that you come up with later on, you know, even tomorrow or next week. Um, I would be happy to hear from you. Thank you, Ms. Murray, for your uh, presentation. Uh, I think we would go to uh, Professor Asnani for his presentation now. Uh, well, friends, it was very, very interesting to hear Dana Murray. She made a lovely presentation and gave all the essential requirements for preparing an RFP and evaluation. I, from my Indian experience, would like to focus a little more on what's wrong, what's going wrong, and how do we need to ensure that those problems do not arise and we get the right kind of partners. And the PPP projects which are coming up after the detailed exercise of transaction advisory services, they survive. Indian experience has shown that many projects have been failing, and therefore I have given little more emphasis on those aspects which might be of interest to those who are participating. A little bit situation of India with 31% uh, urban population out of 1,300 million people, and the waste generation is 1,90,000 tons per day. And India is still fortunate that the per capita waste generation is small. It ranges from 200 grams to 600 grams per capita depending on the size of city and the population. And the base composition has been biodegradable between a range of 40 to 60, paper 9 to 14, plastic 7 to 11, metal this, and others have a very small proportion. And the proportion of inerts is decreasing from year to year, and that's a good sign of improvement in the solid waste management systems. Regulatory framework has been done. The solid waste management rules are in place of 2016 where the directions are clearly given what need to be done, and therefore the RFP when it is made has to take into consideration the regulatory framework. We find very often that the administrators ignore the regulatory aspect and go by the vendor's concerns, that you go for the technology and they go for the technology and ultimately they fail and the entire project collapses. So extremely important that one should clearly see what the loss is Biodegradable waste has either to be composted or you have to go for biomethanation. No other technology is allowed. Recyclables are to be given away to recyclers. They are neither supposed to be uh, burnt, they are not supposed to be given away to landfills. And non-biodegradable and non-recyclable waste are allowed to be taken for waste to energy. They can go for burnt technology. Restricted use, no biodegradable can be burnt, no recyclables can be burnt and only inerts can go for disposal of landfill. This is the broad legal framework. Whosoever prepares the RFP has to keep in mind that he does not go beyond the law, and there's a transaction advisor to be appointed. It can be done without transaction advisor, but it's desirable to have a transaction advisor who will carry through the whole bid process, right from preparing the bid document, preparing the DPRs if necessary, or reviewing the DPR, and finalizing the document. While preparing the document, his first consideration should be that he takes care of the legal aspect just mentioned above. What is the situation in India? The waste composition, if you look at in details, about 37,000 tons can go towards waste to energy. There's a potential of landfilling of inerts, ashes, and rejects, which is about 66,000 tons a day. Mass burn of biodegradable waste is not allowed, and inert ashes are not allowed. 
composting and biomethanation is permissible and it's a, it's a scope of 89,000 tons plus per day that can go for the technology. So we have to look at this scope of work in Indian context that what is the scope of attracting the private players for going for these technologies. So we have to keep an eye on the private players who have experience in the area and the large scope which is available in front of them. Now, what is the support coming up? It's very important to attract the private players. They should know that what is the government of India's policy or national policy, what support can be given to them so that everybody has a good level playing field. Government of India is now giving subsidy for compost at the rate of 1500 rupees per ton, $23 per ton is a subsidy being given to the municipal authority. It can be passed on to the private operator. It can be given away for sale. So this money is available for supporting the composting technology and power purchase, which was a major concern earlier in India, is now getting a benefit that the person who puts up a power plant, his power will be purchased by the power generation, power selling companies at the rate of 7 rupees and 4 paise per unit if they produce power from mixed waste and for 7 rupees and 90 percent paise per unit if they have RDF as a base. So this is the knowledge which people must get who are interested to fill the art, prepare the RFP and who are going to bid that this is what support you are going to get. So he makes up his mind whether he should really go and bid for the particular project and what's the scope of product being sold and marketed. The state and local authorities are also going to give them support and this must be fully known to the people and should be very clearly brought out in the RFP document that land will be given at a nominal lease rate on a license fee, not on a term that he can hold the land. He'll be only having a license to be on the land for a period of 20, 30 years. Free delivery of solid waste at the plant site. He doesn't have to go and search the waste. Power to be purchased by power company at fixed rate and small tipping fee may be given to them in addition to whatever he gets uh, to support the project which is coming up. The concessioner in the Indian contest, it is preferred that it should be DBOOT, the design part should also be left to him. Sometimes it is felt that once the project fails, the blame goes on a designer because somebody else has designed. So it's desirable that the person who is coming up, putting his own money, he may design, he may own, he may operate and he may transfer at the end of the concession period. So that is the most preferred option. Otherwise, one can go for BOOT where somebody else designs the project. He is made responsible for design, construction, operation and maintenance for a period of 20 years can be extended to 30 years. And the recovery of charges, that is being done through the sale of products. In India, still the concept of giving tipping fee is not very much in vogue. The government or municipal authorities feel that the party is earning and therefore we should not give him anything. But the time has now come when the liabilities for law are so strong that one has to spend money of managing the plant. Therefore, it is necessary and essential for him, uh, for the municipal authorities to think of giving tipping fees. Currently, in most of the cases, no tipping fee is paid. They only get the garbage free, they get the land free and thereafter there is a purchase agreement. That's only what they get and they have to manage everything at their own cost. And there's a panel provisions prescribed both for the concessioner and for the municipal authority if they fail to perform. Briefly, I will tell you the past experience of Indian PPP projects which every person, a concessioner, a person who is wanting to bid or a person who is going to design the RFP document should keep in mind. And these issues must be addressed while the document is prepared so that those problems are not faced. Several projects initiated on PPP made have failed due to the reasons. Municipal authorities failed. First thing is they failed to appreciate that this is a PPP contract. He is a partner, he is not a contractor. And so long as this understanding is not reached, these projects don't work. Lack of due diligence on the part of concessioners, they sometimes just jump on the project without knowing the consequences over a period of 20 to 30 years. They, they need to do due diligence whether they will get a right kind of garbage, the garbage is fit for their work, are they going to get a mixed garbage which, which is not fit for producing compost, not fit for producing power. Non-supply of the quantity and quality ensured by the municipal authority is a major concern that also has to be taken care of and municipal authority must commit to that thing and that has to be clearly brought out in the RFP document 
about the liability of the municipal authority in giving the desired quantity and quality of waste. Municipal authorities making their PPP partners responsible for collection of user fees is an unfortunate example in several cities. They want the contractor to bring the money by recovering from the people and they pay him from that money. This is not possible. He has no authority to do, take coercive measures. Therefore, such conditions should not be inserted, which one may take out of uh, very much interest to take the project, but then they fail because they are not in a position to recover the fees. So such conditions should not get into the RFPs. The municipal authorities fail to extend support to the concessioner in the initial period, and because of the poor recovery, he fails, he cannot sustain. Tariff structure does not adequately take the risk of increasing the charges. The tariff fixed today cannot be binding for 30 years. There has to be a clear provision of periodic increase on certain predetermined parameters so that the party is comfortable that the fuel price goes up, he will get the money, the waste structure goes up, he will get compensation. So there should be a clear inbuilt provision how his tariff structure will keep on getting revised from time to time. The supervision is a major casualty in India. The municipal authorities have elected representatives. These representatives interfere and they try to find faults with the concessioners and they are answerable to everybody. It should be a very clear arrangement that supervision should be done by the professionals, if possible by the independent engineers, so that the project works more satisfactorily. The NIMBY syndrome comes up. There are so many public objections come up against the locations. They also have to be fought with not only by the concessioner, but by the municipal authority along with the concessioner. Now, what measures are essential for putting in the RFP? Municipal authority should prepare the concession agreement. First thing, understand that he's a partner. They should ensure supply of committed quantity and quality of waste. Timely payment to the concessioner is a major casualty in India. They commit to pay, they have no money to pay, and therefore it's very essential to escrow account, proper ensuring that the money will be paid, and there should be a mechanism that if the municipal authorities fail to pay, they will get the money on time, and that mechanism has to be brought out. Otherwise, the concessioner finds it very difficult to survive because he has to incur a lot of expenditure. The tariff structure should cover the risk of steep increase and everything. Municipal authorities should undertake the responsibility of collection of user charges instead of passing down the responsibility to the concessioner. Supervision has to be done through the Ministry of Multi-Agencies by the professionals. Selection of appropriate site and all clearances. This is again a major concern that lands are selected later and the contracts are awarded, then years go on till the land is found. No contract should be put into bid until the land is in hand where the processing facility is to be put up or where the landfill site is to be created. It must be ensured and it should be found to be suitable under the law and there should be necessary clearances obtained by the municipal authority in advance. And the direct document must also have dispute resolution mechanism as a part of the contract agreement, clearly binding both the parties for resolving the disputes through a multi, uh, mutually agreed arbitrators. While imposing penalty, the concessioner has to be reasonable and see that whether there is a real fault on the part or there is some situation which may not, which was beyond his control. Technology selection, as I mentioned a little early, technology has to be adopted in terms of the rules. It cannot go by the vendor's choice, it has to go according to law. And from the permissible technologies, one has a choice to go for any of the technologies. All environmental clearances must be taken by the client and the concessioner. Land adjured to be suitable has to be given, and public objection for raised should be properly addressed firmly by the municipal authority. Now, preparing a big document, as, uh, as mentioned earlier by Madam Dana Mori, she has explained very nicely in details the RFQ. RFP and concession agreements are three main documents. RFQ is very essential, very important document to see that you put clearly what qualifications you want to have, what experience you want, what financial standing you want. There should not be any hanky-panky thereafter and people getting together and a lot of uh, mischief takes place or corrupt practices creep in. It's very essential to have an RFQ which clearly brings out the scope of work all the details, just I'll mention that. Uh, the qualification and experience have to be mentioned, which should be prescribed is just enough. It is a common experience that if a work is of one crore, 
they will ask to satisfy somebody else that you should have a capacity of 50 crores if the work is of 10 crores they may say your capacity of 1 crore is also enough or the experience required is of 5 years they will say you should have 20 years so it is very very essential that the qualification financial requirements experience should be such which is just enough what you want to do and whether that person has the experience and qualification you should be happy with it it need not be too high it need not be too low if it is too low anybody will walk in and we will fail if it is too high we are keeping out several prospective bidders from the competition and only few who are on the top will take the contract and we'll be left with paying a huge money to them so it is desirable that we should be very fair have a right kind of qualification and experience described and the relevant experience should be asked several documents put relevant plus add few things which are irrelevant they just they are put to keep the persons out this has to be taken care of while preparing this document fair chance has to be given to the qualified can deliver and then the bid document should be fair transparent it should be it should not be a tailor made qualification of the vested interest should not be getting in this care has to be taken by the person who is preparing the document the transaction advisor has to be extremely careful and rightly brought out by dana mori there has to be the people who are technical expert they have to be the legal expert there have to be people who have a transaction advisory capacity they should take care of these aspects very independently irrespective of the pressure from the client these applications should be evaluated to find out whether the bidder have the desired minimum qualification and experience and financial capability and they should be shortlisted this is the most important task in the hands of bidder thereafter there should be no play that we want to give a contract to a person who is highly qualified once you are shortlisted the person after screening that what you want and they are there then you can give small weightage to the higher qualifications not a larger weightage so that the people who are qualified they are not dropped out in rfp two components instruction to bidder and concession agreement notice of invitation background scope of work these are routine things which we have to provide weightage to be given to the higher qualifications and financial strength there we have to be very clear that how much weightage we would like to give what type of personnel they have to deploy what is the joint venture permitted or not what are the timelines these all facts must come out very clearly in the document and this agreement binding to both the concessioners and the con document contains these details i will not repeat it takes care of scope of work compliance of various laws concessioners obligation obligation of the client obligation of client is very important they get away without any liability and all the burden go on the on the concessioner this has to be very clearly spelled out so that the interest of the concessioner is also protected while the client protects himself every any every time financial model has to be clear handing over requirement force major default and termination handback requirement these all things have to be clearly brought out in the document some points to be taken care of the document has to be very very unambiguous the concessioner and client their roles should be very clearly brought out nothing should be left as decided by the authority as decided by the commissioner none of these words should ever appear in this document because that gives the upper hand to the authority it should be very clearly brought out what is his authority what is not his authority no upper hand to government or government agencies that both are partners contract duration should be determined taking into question the life cycle sometimes the project cost more the components are very expensive and the duration is small this loads the entire weight on the rates it is always desirable to put the time which is co terminus with the investments made with the machinery put up their life cycle that will make the contract very very affordable payment mechanism has to be clearly brought out timeline should be very clearly brought out adequate time should be provided to mobilize many times they put a very short time to start and the person starts running the penalty from day one this has to be avoided partnerships have still to develop in india and therefore they must know that it takes time to mobilize he has to settle down and then they should go on hand holding to him till he stabilizes in a beginning and then the partnership will work for 20 30 years ascertain whether the bid is responsive the normal points have to be seen i will not repeat critical bid evaluation criteria this is this is very very important it has to be all mathematical fair and transparent it should not be left to the whims or to the subject to satisfaction of the authority the marking criteria should be such that does not give undue high weightage weightage has to be given 
undue high weightage to a very high qualification or experience if the requirement of the job does not need that high level of qualification a reasonable weightage only may be given to the bidders having high qualification so that other qualified bidders are not knocked out weightage should be given among the qualified bidders lowest bidder then should be considered then you should not say now this is good and this is uh, this is lower you already pre qualified them they have met the requirements and therefore they have a right to get the bid if their weight is the lowest and therefore this should be the consideration put whatever high qualification you think are essential for the particular project once you have found the people with the exact qualification then the cost should prevail so that you don't disqualify the people on these grounds in exceptional cases requiring high skills and technical skills you can go for quality come cost criteria otherwise you should go for the lowest bid but only from among those who are qualified and who meet the pre bid requirements the qualifying marks should be so prescribed that a reasonably qualified and experienced person gets qualified and becomes eligible for opening the financial bid so this is how i think that we have to evaluate the bids and take care as sadam dana muri has covered the entire gamut of activities that we there i have not insisted on those parts i only wish that the right kind of transaction advisor should be appointed and they should prepare the document very transparent manner looking to the legal requirements and the requirement of that particular job a job is small all qualifications should be accordingly job is highly technical big projects are there put the right kind of qualification and experience but it should give a clear indication by reading the document there is nothing in between the lines it's all very clear what we are suffering in the country is the transparency and that transparency has to be ensured while preparing these documents and if we have fair document fair assessment which is essential we will get right kind of partners to sustain and honesty and integrity of the officials will be above all most important for sustaining the contract thank you right um well then i think uh, uh, we've come to an end to this session uh, we've, we've had uh, a detailed discussion on all the questions thank you professor rasnani and ms dena mare for your thoughts detailed presentations and your time uh, appreciate your participation as a part of this webinar thank you again to all the participants for tuning in uh,